I want to thank everyone in the state of Michigan for being vigilant, for staying home, because which the action that you're taking is helping your household, those you're connected to, our communities across the state, stay safe, and it is saving lives, as you just heard from Dr. Khaldun. I also want to take a moment to give a special and specific thank you to the brave women and men who are continuing to work to ensure that life can be protected, sustained, and supported. That includes our nurses, our healthcare professionals, our nurses assistants, our doctors. That includes the people who are working at the grocery store, making sure the shelves are stocked, our cashiers and our clerks. That includes the people who are working at gas stations across the state to ensure that those workers can get gas in their car to continue to go to work. The first responders, police, firefighters, EMS, the bus drivers and those who work for the public transportation systems across the state of Michigan who are enabling people to still get to where they need to go. And also the people who are working for our utility companies, making sure that our lights, our gas, our heat, electricity, and internet are working so that so many people can stay home and stay safe. These people are the heroes of the COVID-19 pandemic response, and we thank them for their service. The reality is that we still have a lot of work to do before this is over. This has shown us that there is still a lot of progress to be made in many areas, including access to health care, improving our education system and making it more resilient, ensuring up our safety nets like our system to cover people who are unemployed. It's also shown us that despite the progress that has been made for generations in terms of bending our arcs toward justice, we still have to build and we still have to respond to generations of racial disparities and inequity that have impacted communities of color across our state and across the country. Our administration has put in place several measures and pieces of infrastructure to try to address these disparities. Last year, I initiated the Thriving Cities Tour, which traveled to 19 cities across the state of Michigan, starting in my hometown of Detroit. To begin to, act, to begin to respond to how we are addressing and improving quality of life and public health issues in communities across the state. We know that many people of color choose to live in cities in Michigan. And if we can improve the quality of life in cities, we can improve the quality of life for those people. We took those results and then pushed that into the poverty task force that our administration announced via Governor Whitmer's executive order in December. And this poverty task force is seeking to address, working with all of our state agencies, the many inequities and inequalities that have led to people fighting with persistent poverty in the state of Michigan across communities every single day. These inequities have persisted from generation to generation, in part because there hasn't been a clear enough focus on it from state government. And that's why this task force exists to take action. And then in the State of the State address this year, Governor Whitmer announced the Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies Initiative. Which, which was designed to specifically respond to the racial disparity when it comes to maternal mortality. That black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women. And we understand that some of that is contributed to by bias in care, by medical bias in care. And so we were working to research with medical experts across the state to respond to and address this for the long term. But we need to take these measures to a higher level in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. This has shown this, this disease, this infection, has proven particularly deadly to black people in our state. You already heard the governor mention, but it is worth repeating. Black people make up 14% of the population in the state of Michigan. And thus far, we have accounted for 40% of the deaths. We only know this because the state of Michigan was one of the first and remains one of the few states to report its COVID-19 test results and deaths along racial lines. And as an engineer by training from the University of Michigan, I know the importance and value of data and information and how it can contribute not only to understanding problems, but to designing solutions. And the data and information is very clear. There is a specific and severe racial disparity that we need to address. When communities have been impacted by racial disparities for generations, this means it is a systemic problem. And the systemic problem requires a systemic solution. We know that more often than not, people of color do not have the financial luxury in the state of Michigan of being able to work from home, or they are more reliant on public transportation to get groceries or to get to work, or don't have enough money to buy hundreds of dollars of groceries at a time and have to make repeat trips. 
They may not have access to a primary care physician or health insurance. And their neighborhoods may be environmentally compromised because of issues of environmental justice. These dynamics have led to increased risk of exposure for communities of color across the state to this deadly virus. And we're seeing this play out in the data with black people dying at such a higher rate. And to put this in just a personal perspective, I've lost 15 people in my life to COVID-19 and I have a number of others who I'm connected to either professionally, personally, or in my family who are fighting this infection or who are in the hospital right now. This is why the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities is so important. And it's why we must treat this task force a little differently. Rather than just studying the problem and making a report later, we're assembling a team of experts that can take action in real time. Our mission and purpose is simple, to recommend actions to address the racial disparities and the mortality rate of COVID-19. We will go where the science, the facts, the information, and the experiences of people take us. And we'll use that data that we will gather through the increased testing capacity that Dr. Caldoun referred to, combined with best practices identified by experts in the state and frankly around the country about how we can move forward with solutions. In order to improve on these racial disparities, we need to ensure that everyone is represented in this process. The task force, which will be chaired by myself, and will include the Department of Health and Human Services Director Robert Gordon and Dr. Jonay Caldoun, our Chief Medical Executive. It will also have 24 of some of the greatest minds, including doctors, public health experts, scientists, epidemiologists, infectious disease experts, community organizers, academics, civil rights advocates, and labor leaders. We'll be joined by members of our lawmaking bodies in the Michigan legislature and from Congress who will be, a fundamental, will be fundamental members of the team to advocate for policy changes that are necessary. We will have the full weight and power of every state agency and department working with us to bring about swift changes. And this task force will also be calling on the expertise of a broad array of community action stakeholders. We need to take action immediately so that we can save lives starting as soon as possible. The task force has already begun to build out a plan of action that's separated in a few buckets that will help us address what we've identified. And you've heard some of them referred to. The first and most important one to start with is closing the gaps in coronavirus data on race and ethnicity. Dr. Caldoun has already been a leader on this in the state of Michigan and nationally. And we're gonna to continue to ensure that more providers in the state have what they need to be able to report this information and more comprehensive demographic information uh, on a regular basis. And we're also going to be calling on the federal government to do that as well. We were working also to increase testing accessibility to better serve vulnerable communities. Specifically, we want to build on models like the really inspiring one that we've seen from Wayne State University in partnership with Ford that is driving tests to people where they need them and delivering them with a clinician on board. That kind of innovation we need to support and scale. We also want to deliver walk-up testing in different communities, as is particularly homeless rights advocates have noted that if, when people don't have cars, it's difficult for them to consume a drive-through test. But by enabling people to walk to a test, this will enable greater testing accessibility in vulnerable populations. We also want to recommend protocols that address, pe that address people with highly and unique exposure. Again, the public transportation riders, drivers, and staff members, and the people who are working right now, particularly our first responders, and all those that Dr. Caldoun referred to. And I want to highlight a specific example of innovation that's been uh, launched today in Dearborn. With a, it is a drive-through test facility for first responders where they can get a test, and importantly, it enables them to isolate if they test, if they test positive. When talking about Skylar's story, what it, what it brings to heart for me is that her parents are first responders, and the first responders who are working every day have anxiety about possibly infecting people in their household due to their risk of exposure. But the city of Dearborn has stepped up to provide, not just for their city, but for the entirety of Western Wayne County, infrastructure for first responders to safely and confidently isolate and have what they need to recover and not put their family at risk. We also, and this really speaks to the long-term implications, we want to connect people to doctors for care beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to address the fact that many people have feared getting tested they feared going to the hospital, or that we've had doctors who have not prescribed tests when maybe they could have. But a lot of people don't have doctors who are living in persistent poverty. And this is true in a lot of communities of color and in black communities in the city of Detroit. 
but we're working with the team to figure out how we can connect people to doctors, not just so they can get the testing and treatment they need now, but so they can be connected to that care in the long term to help deal with some of the other challenges and health, health issues that when mixed with COVID-19 have proven so deadly. Things like high blood pressure, things like diabetes, and things like asthma to help people with their treatment. Not having access to a primary care physician, that may have been true before, but we can work together to make that true for less people going forward. Under the governor's leadership, the state of Michigan has been recognized as a leader in this area, not only for establishing this task force, but for putting action on the ground right now. The task force will be in place throughout the crisis, and that we hope that we will be able to continue to make recommendations going forward about how we can address racial disparities in a broader sense. This is not something that we can solve overnight, but it's something that we can work on every day to make a difference. And I want to come back to Skylar as I close. Skylar's family lives in the 48219 zip code, which is the second most impacted zip code with 559 positive cases of COVID-19 as of yesterday. It's a predominantly black neighborhood. She is the daughter of two first responders in the city of Detroit. After she was admitted to the hospital, she then developed a very rare complication that led to a swelling of her brain and a lesion in her frontal lobe. She's nearly the same age as my twin son and daughter, Garland and Emily. Her story cuts right to the core of why we must act now, why it's important to, to follow the orders and maintain social distancing because you can carry the virus and spread it without knowing it. It's also impossible to predict how the virus will interact with the person's body. We have to be careful. My condolences, my prayers go to Skylar's family and this task force will serve in her memory to ensure that we can limit the exposure for as many people and as many families as possible. We will get through this together because we are going to work together in a way that we never have before. The irony of the social distancing that we're practicing now is that it actually reveals how connected we all truly are, how much we need each other and rely on one another, how much the impact of our individual choices and actions, how much they have an impact on our community's collective health and well-being. Once we get to the other side of this, I think we're going to be more mindful of how we treat and spend time with one another. We're going to call a little bit more often. We're going to say I love you a little more forcefully. We're going to have more meaningful interactions and conversations. And that connection, that will be the legacy of this pandemic. How we came together, how we work together, how we stay together, and how we stand tall for one another. So thank you and I look forward to continuing to keep everyone updated on the efforts and work of the task force.